Okay, good morning, everyone. So good to be out here this morning. Thank you, James, for leading us in a great time of worship. And we're so thankful for James and his family serving here faithfully week after week, year after year. And we're praying that we'll all see a breakthrough in this town and in this, even in this land through what God's going to do in here, through the body, through you guys, and through us all just coming together, being the body of Christ, filled with the Spirit, and sharing the gospel. And that's what we're really talking about this morning. We're into the next portion of our series on Colossians. So if you've got your Bible, if you open the book of Colossians there with me for a few moments. We're into chapter 1 still. And we're going to break into verse 3 of chapter 1. We're going to read just down a few verses again this week and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Lord, we just pray that we'll settle our hearts. Lord, shut us in with yourself. Uh, Feed your sheep. Strengthen your sheep. Heal the wounded sheep. Strengthen the weak sheep, Lord. And do all that's needed by your Spirit in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. And last week we dealt with with that portion. Um, Now we're into the next part. Of this, and he's talking about of this hope and of this gospel and so on, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And we'll stop there. That's our scripture this week. And I just wanted to take out four truths about the gospel. Now, don't get afraid when I say this, because I'm not going to hammer these titles too much throughout the message, but uh, as we go through this, the four uh, different facts about the gospel and truths about the gospel will touch each one of these bases, if you like. We're going to think about the nature of the gospel. We're going to think about the basis of the gospel, the effect and transmission of the gospel. Now, like I say, don't let those words uh, scare the life out of you, because we'll You can look back over this message later on and you'll see that as we've gone through this, we've touched the nature, basis, the effect and the transmission of the gospel as we've gone through here. But the gospel is truth in a world of lies is my first point. The gospel, says Paul here, it's truth. If you look at that verse, I'll put it up here for you. He says, of this, of this hope, he said, you've heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. That's verse 5. So the gospel, says Paul, it's truth. And I want to say that it's truth in a world full of lies, full of deceit, full of deception. And why is that? Because the Bible says that the whole world outside of Christ, if you're not a Christian, you belong to a different kingdom. You don't belong to the kingdom of God. You belong to the kingdom of what the Bible calls the deceiver, the liar, Satan, the accuser. And the Bible says actually in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world, now listen to this, this is a big claim, and it's true, the whole world lies under the sway or the power of the evil one, the deceiver, the liar. He's the one who leads people astray, away from God. He whispers lies in your ears about God and so on. And the whole world, says John, lies under his power, his sway, his dominion. If you've got a Bible, please open John, John chapter 8, just to hear Jesus, what he has to say about Satan and about his character. So it's John's gospel, and it's chapter 8, and it's verse 44. And listen to what the Lord says about him. He says to people who aren't obviously believing in him, he says to them, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and he's the father of lies. 
Because I tell you the truth, he says, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Because they're off their father, the liar. You see, what, what the Lord's saying there is, Satan is essentially a liar. He's a liar from the beginning. He's a deceiver from the beginning. From the very beginning, he's a murderer. Uh, if we go back into the garden, what does Satan start to do with the truth? God's word is truth. God told them a word. He said, you can eat of all the trees in the garden, but not of this tree in the midst of the garden. The day you eat of that tree, essentially, he says, you're going to die. Now, what Satan does, he comes along and he gets his hands on God's truth, the word of God, and he says to the, to the woman and to the man, through the woman, he says, uh, has God really said? Can you, can you has, has God said this? Is this God's word? Is this true? And then the insinuation is, is God even good? What's God up to giving you a command like this? And then he goes on further and he explicitly that's insinuating stuff. Has he really said this? That's like an insinuation. Then he goes a step further when he gets them on the hook and he goes all out, flat out, and he totally contradicts, he flat out contradicts God's word because God said, when you eat it, you die. Satan says, you will not surely die. Total contradiction. He totally contradicts God's word because he's a liar from the beginning. And that lie, you see, if you swallow Satan's lies about God and about God's goodness and about the gospel of God and of Jesus Christ, if you swallow his lies about this, it leads to death. And God says, you will surely die. Satan says, you'll not die. You can, you can ignore the gospel. You can ignore Jesus. You'll not surely die. And the, God says, listen to me. My word is truth. This is the gospel of truth. Of this you heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. You see, gospel, the gospel's true. And the wages of sin is death. And if we reject Christ, we remain dead in our sins. But the gospel is also true this way because the gospel says, if you come to me and if you repent and put your faith in Jesus, here's what's true. You'll be saved. You'll be forgiven. You'll become a child of God and you'll leave the kingdom of lies and you'll come into the kingdom of God's only son, who is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the world, essentially, is under the sway of the evil one. Now, what would that mean? Uh, lies are Satan's native language. Uh, the world is under his sway, so we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So what does this all mean? It means that whenever we step outside of the church and we're surrounded by media, we're surrounded by the, the academy, the intellectuals, we're surrounded by the films and the arts and the music and the government um, uh, uh, policies and so on. All of that is in some sense, in some way, under his sway. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but behind the systems of the world, there is an evil deceiver at work leading us into ungodly policies, ungodly morals, ungodly attitudes. How do we govern our country? Well, let's do these things. Now, behind that, they might not even know it. Some of them positively do know that Satan's at work. Some of them are in league with him. Many people, because he's a deceiver, you see, the, the, the nature of being deceived is you don't really know about it. Many people are just in the flow and being deceived by the enemy, and this is the fruit of it, because... Arts and music and film, every single thing carries a message. And Satan wants to get his message out. He wants to get his lies out. He wants to get his philosophy into your ears. Is all music bad? No. Are all films bad? No. But we have to be discerning. And we have to understand that behind the systems, there's a liar at work. What's he wanting to do? Fill our lives full of lies and take us away from Jesus and the truth. There's an image in Revelation that just keeps coming to me, and I have it wrote down here, but I, I was debating whether or not to share it. But there's an image in the book of the Revelation of the, like the dragon, the serpent. And at one point in the book of the Revelation, uh, out of the, the serpent's mouth comes a flood of water, like a river of water coming out of his mouth. And many commentators say this points us towards like a torrent of lies, like a river of lies coming from the serpent's mouth that he wants to sweep the saints away with. He wants to sweep us away in a, in a river of lies and take us down that river to our death. 
That's in Revelation 12. So the gospel you see Paul says here is the truth. And before we move on out of this, I think the Lord would really want us to get our hands on this this morning and settle it in our hearts. You see, that the gospel is the truth. We won't share it unless we really believe it, that we believe it's true, that we believe it's necessary, that we believe it's relevant to people, and so on. And the Lord really wants us to leave here this morning making a decision in our hearts again. Yes, what Paul says here in Colossians, it is the word of truth. This is the word of truth. And the Bible is clear on why it's the word of truth, because in 2 Timothy, Here's what, here's, what it calls, here's what it describes the Bible as being. Okay, now listen, the Bible is scripture. And Paul says this in Timothy. And he tries to get this young man to get this into his bones and into his DNA. He says this, All scripture is breathed out by God. And it's profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God or that the woman of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. But the this first start of that verse is what we want to focus on. And I believe the Lord would be, the Holy Spirit wants to, to emphasize this to your heart this morning. Do you believe that all Scripture is breathed out by God? It's God-breathed. What does that mean? Well, God doesn't tell lies, and God doesn't get things wrong. God's not deceived. God doesn't need correction. And if, if this is God's word, this is truth. All scripture is breathed out by God, the God who doesn't lie, the God who tells the truth, the God who doesn't get it wrong, and the God who doesn't need correction. So the scriptures are God-breathed, and the Lord says to your heart this morning, do you believe it? Do you believe it? The gospel's true. The Bible's true. It's God-breathed, all of it from start to finish. When Satan comes along and starts to poke at the Bible and say, what about this, what about that? Surely we can't believe this anymore. Surely morals have moved on from that 2,000 years ago. We've got to say, hang on a minute. All scriptures breathed out by God. Who am I to come along after God and side with the devil and say, you know what, we'll change a bit. We'll soften a bit. We'll ignore a bit. We can't do it. And the Lord wants to burden our hearts this morning. Christian, make a decision. Do you believe it or not? Do you believe it or not? Is the Bible God's word? Is it true? Of this you've heard before, and Paul says it here, in the word of the truth, the gospel. Do you believe the gospel's true? The gospel is true. There is a heaven and a hell, but forgiveness is available. The gospel's true. The Father sent the Son to die on the cross for all your sins in your place. The gospel's true. The gospel's true. Jesus came out of the tomb. On the third day, he rose again. He's alive. He's beat death. He's defeated Satan. He's conquered sin. And you can join him in the victory. It's all true. Jesus ascended into heaven. It's true. Jesus is coming back to bring a new heaven and a new earth. It's true. Do you believe it? It's either true or it's false. And if it's true, we've got to go all in. And we've got to get with it. And the Lord says, come on now, do you believe what this Bible verse is saying to your heart today? You've heard this before in the word of the truth. Is it true? It's true. Then the next thing in the, in the verses that we encounter about the gospel, the next gospel lesson is this. Paul tells us that the gospel, because it's true, it bears fruit. It changes, changes people. Which... He talks about the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing so it's not only seeing people saved it's seeing people grow it's seeing people added to the kingdom it's bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you that's verse six so that's our second point the first point is the gospel is truth in a world of lies and the second point this morning is that the gospel actually bears fruit it makes a difference in your life It'll make a difference in other people's lives too as we share it. The gospel bears fruit and actually, he says, increases. Now, God's heart this morning is for us to understand this, that bearing fruit and increasing is God's desire for you. It's God's desire that you actually bear fruit in your life and increase throughout your life. It's a, it's a journey of transformation and increase it's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. God wants to make you increasingly fruitful for him. I'm not talking to the person beside you or behind you 
or in front of you. I'm talking to you. If you're a Christian, if you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, God loves you. And his desire for your life is that you prosper and grow and become more like his son. And that you become fruitful for him in his work and that you increase year by year in this. And God wants to see, you see, this gospel, not only in the individuals as we leave here, that you'll be fruitful and increase. God wants to see this church, this body of people here, he wants to see us collectively fruitful and increasing. He wants to see these seats filled with people who are in the wrong kingdom before they come in here or before you met them out there. He wants to see fruitfulness and an increase in the work in here, in this place, in every church. He wants us to do well and to grow and to prosper. You see, a fruitful place, if the Holy Spirit's moving and if he's bearing fruit in your life and if you're walking with Jesus, this will be a fruitful place. It won't be a barren place. There'll be life. There'll be things happening. There'll be people, I wrote down here, well, what would a fruitful place actually look like? If a, what would a fruitful life and a fruitful church look like? Well, people being saved. People growing, becoming more like Jesus. People maturing and finding their gift and actually serving the Lord in new ways. People receiving vision from the Lord. I want to do this for Jesus. I think we should do this for the Lord. I think God wants to use me this way in his kingdom work. People being changed and transformed. That's what it will look like. And then personally, we all know those verses in Galatians. And I want us to read them again. Personally, the flesh will be put down more and more in our lives. And the fruit of the Spirit, personally, and each individual will be increasing. Let me read to you a few verses here. From Galatians 5. And I'm going to start in verse 19. Uh, now, the works of the flesh, you know, that's the old man or the old woman. The work of the flesh is, is uh, the old nature, as it's put so often. What, what you were like before you had the Holy Spirit indwelling you. That life of the flesh is what you were living and I was living. Now, he says this. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, clearly seen. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. He says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then here's the fruit. This is what the Lord wants to, to show us. The gospel is a fruitful thing. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited and provoking one another and envying one another. And we'll stop there. You see, the heart of the Lord and the Holy Spirit this morning is to remind us that the gospel actually is to change us. We get saved and then we change and then we grow. We receive the gospel and then we increase in Christ's likeness. My worst nightmare, I've wrote here, my worst nightmare is to, to just give up. For people in here and for myself, everyone is in danger of this. To go so far with Jesus and his work of transformation in our lives. And then just to sit down and say, I'm saved. I'll dander about 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and then I'll die. And we don't take seriously that the Holy Spirit is living water flowing through us to, to refresh us and to change us and to help us reach people and refresh those around us. And my worst nightmare is to say, I'm going to not go on, Lord. I don't want to take another step. I don't want to hear about your plans for my life because I've got plans, thanks. I've got a business to run. I've got this to do, that to do. And, and, and what you're asking of me and, and to give my life into would cost me too much. I'm not going your way. I'm not going to be fruitful and increase. The Lord has different plans for each of our lives. 
What he'll ask of me, he'll not ask of you. He'll ask something of you. And what the Lord wants is for you to be open and to take steps as he speaks. What does God want to do in your life? Because if we don't do this, the lost won't be saved. The sick won't be healed and the good news won't be preached to the poor and those in prison will not be set free. And that's what Jesus came to do. And he's going to do it through us. So, the rivers of living water come. When we get saved, we get the Holy Spirit. And he is bursting to do stuff in your life. He is bursting to reach people through you, to flow through you, to see a work of God done in you and through you. And how are we going to see this done as, as individuals? What can I do? What, Mark, what, what should I do? How can I see anything happen in my life? I would just say a few things here. I would say, spend time with Jesus. Spend time in the Word. Let God speak to your heart. I never hear from God when I open the Bible. Well, the Bible's God's Word. You do hear from Him. And the more you read it and bring it into your life, you'll get a fresh Word. You'll get fresh hope. You'll get fresh strength. As you interact with God's Word day by day, you become fruitful and you'll increase. Uh, Jesus said, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And he said, abide in my word. And that's what we have to do. We have to come close to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm on for this journey. I want to do this, this life thing with you. I want to give my life to you completely. And I want to see you do a work in me. And I, Lord, as I open your word, speak to me. And you know what happens very often? And you've got to trust this is right. Um, God gives us stuff to hand on to others. As I'm reading the word, and as I'm uh, asking the Lord to speak to me and teach my stupid heart and teach my foolishness and help me to, to take ground and stop being so uh, pig-headed and stubborn and so on, as he does that to us, we get a word from him. We get an insight into truth, and he'll speak a word to your heart, and it's good for you, and it'll teach you. But then that's for you then to process that, and also you can hand it on to other believers. Do you know what Jesus showed me this week? You know, I was struggling with this, and, and the Lord, he showed me this verse. What do you think? And that verse that fed you will feed someone else. And as you become fruitful and increase through fellowship, other people will be fruitful and increase through you too. As we grow together like that, that's what God wants to do. And sometimes, as you read the Word, God will be teaching you, and you'll meet someone that week. And if you're alert to what God is opening, that word that God's given you, that fresh manna, will very often be the relevant thing for the person you're meeting. That, that thing about the gospel that you thought was wonderful this week, as you meet the unbeliever, you can share that wonderful thing about Jesus with them. Say, isn't it wonderful how Jesus forgives us for free? I was just thinking this week about that Jesus is actually God in human flesh. And he came and he died on a cross. And we don't deserve it. And it really hit my heart this week how unworthy I am and how good God is to us. You know, people need to hear these things. And as you're getting it fresh, and what I'm trying to say is this, as you're getting the fresh manna, you can feed the multitudes. You'll feed people. People will be touched by God through your life. You'll be fruitful and you'll increase. That's what the gospel does. It bears fruit. It changes people. Now, the third thing is this, and this is the nature of the gospel. The gospel is a message of grace. And that's what God wants us to remember today too. As you're sharing the gospel with people, remember the word grace. Grace is a wonderful word. He says, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Understanding the gospel, you can say, you can put it like this, is understanding the grace of God. That's what to understand the gospel is. Someone who doesn't understand what grace is doesn't know the good news because the grace... As the grace is the foundation of the good news. We're saved by grace. And you need to understand grace to understand the gospel and to share it. If we leave grace out, we haven't shared the gospel. Now, what is grace, Mark? Grace is this. Here's a definition. Grace is God's undeserved favor towards man. God giving us stuff we don't deserve and we don't earn. God given us heaven, undeserved favor towards us. And that's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is a wonderful message of grace. 
No one deserves it, since she heard of the grace of God and truth. Grace means we get what we don't deserve. Mercy means we don't get what we do deserve. That's what it is. And that's what the gospel is all about. Grace means that you get to heaven by a gift. God gives you heaven as a gift. You don't earn it and you can't work for it and you can't pay for it and you can't be born into it and so on. It's given to you as a gift. How do you receive the gift? You receive it by faith in Jesus. See, we don't work for heaven. Jesus Christ did all the work for us to get us to heaven. And grace is coming into the good of it. Jesus wants to give us a gift. He wants to give us eternal life. He wants to give us freedom. He wants to adopt us into his family. And he wants to give it to us for free right now. Religion says work for it. The gospel says receive it. Religion says work for it. The gospel says receive it. It's a gift. It's grace. How do we receive it? By faith. The Lord showed me like a, as I was thinking about this, to communicate this, you know, heaven won't be like the Oscars. You know, the Hollywood Oscars ceremony where everyone's there and everyone's in the room because of merit, because of their performance. Religion's all about performance and you've got to earn heaven. Heaven's not going to be like that. Heaven's not going to be like the Oscars. Everyone in there is patting each other on the back. Everyone in there is getting their reward that they received, that they earned. They did a great performance. They performed so well and they were so believable and good. Here's your Oscar. Heaven's not like that. Heaven is a party. But everyone in there will be looking at each other going, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not worthy. I haven't earned anything, but here I am in an eternal party. And the only one worthy in the room is Jesus. The only one that we'll be uh, looking to and thanking is Jesus. This world operates on meritocracy. It operates on if you, if you work hard and earn it, you'll get something back. The gospel is not a meritocracy. No one earns it. Jesus did it on the cross. He died for all your sins. He bore the penalty in your place. And we receive the good of it by simply saying, thank you. I trust you. I believe you. I'll follow you. So heaven's not like the Oscars. We won't be patting each other on the back. There'll be no boasting. There'll be no saying, I, I done so much praying and now I'm here. I, I hardly missed a week of church. I, I gave so much of my finances here, there and everywhere. They're all good things, but they don't get you into heaven. There's no boasting in heaven. Only Jesus on the stage. Oh, we're all around the throne and we're saying worthy is the lamb and we don't look at each other and say and you're a bit worthy too and I'm a bit worthy worthy is the lamb who was slain and it's by his blood that we're saved so grace is a gift and I just want to ask you have you received the gift are you determined to earn something you can't earn you can't earn heaven you can't be good enough you can't say enough prayers the Lord showed me this because of my legal background. Good works can't save, right? And I was just thinking about this, about the world thinks if I do enough good, I'll get in, or my good works should outweigh my bad works. Surely if I do more good than bad, I'm in. Well, put it like this, our justice system doesn't work like that. No one thinks that it's a clever or sensible thing to do to come before a judge and maybe you've killed someone during the week, right? And now you're up for murder or you've stolen something during the week. Let's think of it like this. So you've got a sin. Now you're before the judge and now justice is going to be dished out. And no one thinks it's a good defence to come before the judge and say, hang on a minute, Your Honour. Let's do a balancing act here. I killed one person. There's eight billion other people in the world who I didn't kill. I've done a lot of good works. What good works have you done? I haven't killed eight billion people. Surely that's enough good to outweigh the bad. And the judge will say, well, very good. You, you shouldn't have killed people. Good works aren't a credit to your account because we need to deal with the sin in this courtroom. Sin's the problem, not your good works. I stole one item out of that shop, but there was loads of stuff on the shelves that I had done good works towards in terms of I didn't steal them. I didn't steal everything. I just took one wee thing. I only stole one ring out of the jeweler's. 
I didn't take the watches. And the judge will say, hang on a minute, that's good works that you didn't steal a lot of stuff. You've done so much non-theft, but you've committed a theft. And it's like that with God. We come before God with our sin, and we can't say to God, hang on a minute, God, look at all the good. Well, God says, you're supposed to be good. I believed in you. You're supposed to believe in me. It's the sin that's the problem. That's why I sent Jesus to die for you. We need to deal with sin. This is how justice works. This is what God's saying. We need to have a saviour from our sin because good works cannot outweigh bad works. The bad works have to be dealt with and paid for and either we pay for them or we allow Jesus to pay the price. Which is it? And that's grace. We're saved by grace, not by good works. And then finally, this morning, the gospel, how does it get transmitted? How does it get how does it become fruitful and increase and all of that? Well, the gospel must be carried by individuals. That's what our final point is. He says, you learned it. Well, you learned the gospel. You learned it from where? Did, did, did an angel speak to you? Did you have a dream and the whole gospel came to you like that? No, this is the way the gospel normally comes to people. You learned it from Epaphras. A Christian was bothered to share the gospel with you guys. And now there's a church here. You learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. You see, how the gospel spreads, if it's ever going to take root, uh, in your family and in this town and in this land, is when Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit, they understand the grace of God and truth, they believe the gospel is the truth, and then they go and share it. That's how things happen. You open your mouth for Jesus. God will open doors for you. You need to be, you need to be close to Jesus, filled with the Spirit, and say, look, I want to share with you the good news. We have to carry the gospel. It won't get to your friends unless you carry it. It won't get to people around us unless we speak. The gospel spreads because of faithful fellow servants, beloved fellow servants who, who take it and who share it. People need the gospel. People are asking questions about life and death. Don't listen to Satan, that liar that we talked about at the start. He's saying to you, no one wants to hear this. This is bad news. Imagine talking like this to people. This is good news. This isn't bad news. This is good news of freedom and forgiveness. And people are walking about with a load of guilt on their back and they don't know what to do with it. And they're facing death in the face. And they're going to come into judgment. And they know there's something up ahead, but they don't know where they're going. And they have never heard about the love of God. And they've never heard that salvation is a gift. And they need you to share it with them. This is good news. Jesus died for you and he loved you. People need to be like Epaphras. That's what the Holy Spirit's saying into this room today. Would you be like an Epaphras? Would you be like this, this minister of God who took the gospel, he heard it from Paul, he got saved, and then what did he do? He just passed it on. The Bible says that how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful are those feet? Have you got beautiful feet? Romans 10 puts it like this. Listen to this. And I'm going to close and we're going to pray. But Romans 10 puts it like this. as a challenge to our hearts this morning. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Very good. That's, that's true. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. If you trust Jesus, you're going to heaven. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? How then are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And God's saying to us this morning, will you share the message? You don't go on a mission as Christians. You don't go on a mission here and there. You look back and, well, we were in Africa 20 years ago. It was great. We went on a mission then. And then we went on another mission to Romania five years ago. And we've done a few missions in our life. That's not the Christian life. You don't go on a mission. You are on a mission every day. We, Christians don't go on a mission. Christians are on a mission. 
Our life is a mission. Every day we wake up, we serve Jesus. Every day we wake up, God might give us an opportunity to share the gospel. Every day we wake up, we live with Jesus and we follow him and we serve him and that's exciting. It's far more exciting than living for yourself, living for the world. It's exciting to walk with the living God and to be on mission with him. So these are the the four things this morning. The gospel is truth in a world of lies. Do you believe it? The gospel bears fruit, is it? Is it bearing fruit in your life? The gospel is a message of grace. You can't earn heaven. God loves you and he wants to give it to you as a gift. And I want to encourage you, if you're here this morning or you're watching online, receive Jesus as your saviour. Receive the gift of eternal life. Just receive it. Humble your heart and say, look, I can't make it in. I see the point of that illustration with the judge. I can't bring my good works to outweigh even a single sin. Can't be done. I need Jesus. And it's by grace I'm going to be saved. And finally, um, the gospel must be carried with us day by day. We're not to go on a mission now and then. We're on a mission every day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your wisdom in this book. We thank you, Lord, that you're here. You've promised to be here and you're moving in our hearts. And Lord, you've got a special word for each of us. I believe that there's a word for every single person who listens to this message. And I believe, Holy Spirit, you're speaking to hearts. If it's for salvation, Lord, draw these people to Jesus. If it's, Lord, for growth in some area, for change in some area, Lord, help people, empower them. We can't do it on our own. Without you, we can do nothing. Lord, draw near us, each and every one of us. Lord, if you're giving someone vision for something, you're burdening them for something, for the kingdom, Lord, open doors for them and make it clear to them. Lord, just do your work in us right now. And then, Lord, do a work through us this week and the rest of the year and the rest of our lives, Lord. Help us. Bring us to life. Lord, we pray that we would know what it means to have that river of living water that would flow in our lives. Forgive us our sins. Help us to see victory in our life, Lord. If you don't know Jesus and you want to come to know him, I pray that you'll, you can follow me in this prayer. It's a simple prayer. Who wants to receive the grace of God? Who wants to stop trying to earn it? Who wants to know that you're forgiven and the guilt's lifted? If that's you, you can come to the water of life and you can freely drink. And if that's you, and if you want to open your life to Jesus right now, you can pray this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I know I can't save myself. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to die on the cross for all my sins. I open up my life to Jesus. I believe he died for me and he rose again for me. Holy Spirit, fill me now and change me. I'll turn away from sin and I want to follow Jesus. Save me. Help me. Keep me. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.